um, take a look tonight then at Philadelphia. We've just read um, Revelation 3, verses 7 to 13. And um, we're going to uh, go through a section tonight that has to do with really just the first part of this letter. And this is the sixth of seven letters. Um, so we've been going through and we've looked at the previous five. And uh, Philadelphia, just as, as far as where it sat, I've got a little, just a map up here. This is um, the area of uh, Asia, really. Galatia's here, Bithynia, that we read about in the, uh, the New Testament. So you've got your, your ecclesia, starts with Ephesus, then Smyrga, per Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, and then Philadelphia. So they are actually in succession. If you were to travel this route, they are in a circular route, right? So that's sort of um, one of the reasons why they believe that they're in the order they are, because it would be the order that you would travel if you were going from one place to the next. So at Philadelphia, and um, this city is, again, related really to the time of the Greeks, is where it begins, because its name is a Greek name. And um, it comes from a guy named Eumenes II, who was the, um, his brother was a man named Attalus II. And Attalus, of course, if you remember, um, was the one who didn't have any children. Um, so what he ended up doing was he, um, or sorry, it was his, his son, Attalus III, a guy named Philometer, who basically, um, yes? The Link. The Link? Manager Shining on. Um, hold on one sec. ChristadelphianResource.com. Is what she's got to go through. Jonathan, when you say Atlas, is it A T T I L U S? A T T A L U S. Okay. Atlas. As opposed to Atlas. Correct. Right. It's got an extra A in there. Okay. Right? Okay. So he was the one, if you remember, who um, bequeathed the empire to the Romans. Right? So this is his father, uh, basically, or it's his father's brother, actually. So his father really loved his brother, and so he called the city Philadelphia, meaning love of brethren, because it was his <coughs> brother, um, according to the Greeks anyway. Um, and of course, it went on from there and was transferred to his brother, who would be his successor. And then basically, um, after that, it went to uh, Atlas the, the third. Um, and he bequeathed it to the Romans. So that's just sort of like its background. It's in that same group of cities um, that we've looked at with the other ones, that a lot of them had their, their background with the Greeks and the Romans. So that's kind of where it comes from. How's she doing, Shay? She got it? So... We're going to take a look at the um, section that has to do with um, the title, um, Him That Is Holy and True, to start with, in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7. So let's get out of the way. So that's the, um, the title, um, and the diaglot reads a little differently on this. In so, as opposed to he that is holy and he that is true, it reads um, the holy one and the true one, right, is what the diaglot reads. And that's the way Brother Thomas translates it as well. Yeah. Um, so basically, it's, it's a title of Christ. It's not describing him in a sense of, you know, the one that's holy and the one that's true. It's more the title of the holy one and the true one. And, um, and it's, of course, one of the titles of the deity. So it is uh, the holy one, is the, the phrase we're looking at. And it's a title of the deity. In other words, it's a title of God. And that we get from Isaiah chapter 1, and we want to read verse 4. So 
So whoever we got up to, if we could have Isaiah chapter 1 in verse 4. So we're looking at this concept of the Holy One as being a title of the deity. And um, this is where that title is actually expressed, or one of the places that it's expressed. So Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 4. A sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, and a, a seed of evil doers, children are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger, they are gone away backwards. Thanks, Josiah. So this is his title, the Holy One of Israel. And um, it's a word that's familiar to us um, when you look at its, its meaning. Uh, so this phrase, the Holy One, is 6918, and it's um, Kadosh. Um, which basically is the idea of set apart. And does anybody remember what that is in the Greek in the New Testament? Nope. Uh, that's still in the that's still Old Testament. Somebody that's set apart, or the old called ones, the ecclesia? No. Uh, not quite. Hagios. Yes, it's the saint, right? So it's from um, six nine four two, which is the one. Sam was mentioning, Kadash, which basically means to sanctify, or as it's used, the saints or a saint. All right, so that's the, that's the expression that's used, um, and in this section, um, what he's saying is, look, Israel has provoked the Holy One to anger. Right? So they had gone against what God had wanted them to do. They provoked him to anger. And consequently, um, he is going to get rid of them out of the land, as he talks about later on. Um, it's a process that takes place. But there still would be a remnant left. So we just have uh, verse 9, Isaiah 1, verse 9, flat red. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. So here we have the expression, is that there is a very small remnant that are going to be left, right? So when you look at that, and you say, okay, well, what's the, the who is the remnant? The remnant would be the ones who would, of course, accept the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and this, is, uh, this comes through into the New Testament, um, because he's the one that they have to accept who was dead, but is alive forevermore. So, Revelation chapter um, 1 and verse 18, um, he is described as the living one, and of course they would have to believe that. So, Revelation 1 verse 18. Can I just back up just a little bit, Jonathan? Yeah. Um, Strong's number 6918. I got confused about Kadesh and ha Hagios there. Hagios is the Greek. Oh, gotcha. Okay, okay. so Kadesh is the, the Hebrew to okay. set apart holy. Okay. Um, from, or Kadosh is from Kadesh. Okay. Which means uh, to sanctify. Gotcha. So when you think of, uh, there's a, a, a song you may have heard, Or Kadesh, mm -hmm. a new light will shine. So it's basically quoting this here. Um, it's, it's the idea of something that's holy or sanctified or set apart. Um, or is the light, and Kadesh is the idea of something that's holy. So Christ is described, coming back to Revelation 1, verse 18, as the living one, and the remnant are the people who would accept that fact. Right. So when the Lord Jesus Christ was here, um, and you go through the whole process of, of what took place, he was, of course, rejected by his people, but he was resurrected. And he's described in Revelation 1, verse 18, as the living one that has the key to hell and death and so on and so forth. Um, but he is the one who escapes. And if you just come over to Isaiah 10, you kind of pick up this thread. 
And this is sort of the, the background to this whole idea that we're looking at. We're going to look at in his title that comes up later on in this exact same, same prophecy. So Isaiah 10 and verse 20, we have here, um, if we can just have Isaiah 10 verses 20 and 21 read for us. And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote them which shall stay upon Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. Okay, so they're going to stay upon the Lord. Right? And he's described there as the Holy One of Israel. Right? So this is uh, verses 20 and 21. Um, yeah, so there's actually um, Yahweh as well, it's capital L-O-R-D. So in that case there, Laura, your question was, mm -hmm. how do we know? Um, and, and the reason is, um, like the Jews actually don't even say Jehovah or uh, Yahweh or anything like that, they say Hashem which simply means the name, right? Because they will not pronounce the name, because you will not to take the name of the Lord your God in vain, right? Okay. So it's kind of a superstition that's come out of that. Okay. That was picked up by the translators um, of the King James, who okay. wouldn't translate the name Yahweh in its original form. Okay. It was then picked up by others who then used Jehovah, because it's like, it's not the name Yahweh, but it's kind of a, Sounds like, but not quite. Yahweh, uh, Jehovah, isn't that the, the consonants of Yahweh, but with the Donai vowels? Yeah, so they've kind of changed it so that you're not actually saying the name, but you're kind of saying the name. So, like, we still have it. Like, Brother Thomas, when he first started writing, would use the word Jehovah, because people knew what it meant. Mm -hmm. um, but later on, as he wrote, he kind of ditched it all together and just got into using Yahweh. Um, Brother so Robert, Roberts... Robert, Roberts didn't use it, did he? What's that? Robert Roberts didn't use Yahweh. Not so much, no. no. I think he went more with what was um, familiar to Christians, yeah. I would say, um, yeah. in the Victorian era, which Jehovah was quite familiar to them. Yeah. And in some of our hymns, uh, used, a lot of them used to use the word Jehovah. Some of them have now changed it out to Yahweh. Um, and some of them they didn't. I don't know why they didn't, but it annoys me. But anyway, um, <laughs> it's one of those things. Um, but so anyway, there's a remnant left, and notice what it says here, though. They stay upon Yahweh, okay? And, um, and then he goes on to say, the Holy One of Israel, right? So he, he, that's one of his titles. So it's the Holy One of Israel. So what it's telling you here is this remnant, it's the same remnant, right, that are left, um, the ones that had angered the Holy One of Israel here are now the remnant that are left, or sorry, not the ones that have angered him, but the remnant that were left in verse 9. Mm -hmm. In chapter 10 are the ones who stay upon Yahweh. He's their trust. He's what they hope in. And he's described again as the Holy One of Israel. And this is the same word, Kadosh, uh, 6918, um, that is used elsewhere. Right? So it's the remnant that returns. Right? Notice that? The remnant that has returned, right? Um, they've escaped of the house of Israel. And uh, they, they now stay upon him and, um, and basically put their trust in Yahweh. And the remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. So it's the idea of coming back to the land, but also coming back to God. Um, now, just when you think of this idea of the holiness of God, um, just a couple of verses... Um, Exodus 3, verse 5. This is, of course, where um, Moses is introduced uh, at the burning bush, right? And do you remember what happened there? So this is kind of the, the event that took place. Um, so somebody can read Exodus 3, verse 5. And he said, Draw not nigh, is it? Put half thy shoes from half thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. Right, so when he's introduced to the deity, so to speak, 
um, its holy ground. So when he's talking to the angel of his presence, he's told the place where you're standing is holy ground, right? So it's the same word that's used there. Um, and it's also a picture of how God characterizes himself uh, when he's talking to Israel. Um, so Hosea 11 verse 9 is the other one just on this. Hosea chapter 11, verse 9, Paul, if you could read that for us. So this is how God, again, he's talking about his, um, his character and how that he's merciful. He could come and judge them, but he's not going to in the, in the way that he could. I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man the Holy One in the midst of thee, and I will not enter into the city. Okay, so here we have God's description of himself. And this is a great Trinity verse. Um, I am God and not man. Of course, you reference this with Timothy. There is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, and God says, well, I'm God, I'm not man. Cool. Can right? I so that, it's just that Timothy verse first? Oh, you would ask for where it's from. Um, Can you just I know where it is on the page. Can you just Google I know what the color is. Just a second. Wait, wait, Aaron will help me out here. Uh, I am one man in there. Do me here. One Timothy 2, verse 5. Yeah. One Timothy 2, verse 5. Thank you. So, I am God, not man. As opposed to what Paul says, there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And here God says, well, I'm not man. So it just doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. But so he's the, he is, though, the Holy One in the midst of thee. And it comes up over and over again um, where he says, look, be ye holy, for I am holy. So what he's looking for is for us to manifest this characteristic and to develop the same characteristic in ourselves. So there is, there is definitely a, uh, a characteristic of God that he is called the Holy One. But in this case, it's a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And remember, he says, I'm God and not man here, but now you have the man, the Lord Jesus Christ, and this man, as we looked at in Revelation, is called the Holy One and the True One. So... That's the characteristic that needs to develop. Notice, though, that Hosea 9, or 11, verse 9, is talking about mercy. He's talking about mercy, and God makes the point. I have mercy, he says, because I'm God and not man. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's something for us to sort of take away, is mercy is not an easy characteristic to develop, um, because it's not really in our nature to be merciful. Um, it's, it's just, we're very legalistic quite often in our approach to things, um, and we are not usually by nature a merciful people. So here, God is, is striving or driving the point home, I'm God, not man. Now, remember, mercy is really judgment that could be given or should be given that is deserved, that's withheld, Right? Whereas grace is favor that is given that's not deserved, right? So that's kind of just a, a layman's d differentiation between so the two. Like two sides of a coin. Yeah, so one is the punishment you should get that you don't because God is merciful. The other one is the favor you shouldn't get but you do because God is gracious, right? Mm -hmm. So those are the two things. And here God is driving the point home in Hosea. Look, I could come and I could do all this judgment, but I'm not going to do it because I'm God and I'm not man, right? So, again, just a, a real kind of like asterisk for us to develop mercy. So, when in doubt, mercy. Um, because with what judgment you judge, with what measure you meet, it's going to be measured unto you. So, the merciful, we're told elsewhere, is going to receive mercy. So, it's a, it's a characteristic that we seriously want to develop because it's one that no doubt um, I know you. Did you just erase a word that didn't get photographed? No, we did photograph oh, okay. it. Okay, all 
Yes. Yeah. We did it very surreptitiously. Yeah, good word. <laughs> so um, it's it's a uh, it's a characteristic that we need to develop because it's not really something that is that is there in us. Um, so I want to go now back to Isaiah 10, or if we're still in Isaiah 10, and just look at verses 16 to 17. So Isaiah 10, where we were, and just examine verses 16 to 17, because there's a little point that comes out of this while we're following this, this line of thought along. So Fred, if you could read that for us. Isaiah 10, verse 16 to 17. Therefore the Lord, the God of hosts, will send a wasting disease among his stout warriors. And under his glory a fire will be kindled like a burning flame. And the light of Israel will become a fire, and his holy one a flame. And it will burn and devour his thorns and his briars. Single day. Okay, so here you have some components in this. You've got the glory of God, mm -hmm. and then you've got a burning that's like the burning of a fire. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you think of the burning bush, and you had the glory of God there, and all those components. We're now seeing a similar thing. But what Brother Thomas drives home is that there is a differentiation here. You've got the light of Israel, right? So there's one of one of the components is the light of of Israel, and that's for a fire, and then the second thing is the Holy One of Israel, um, or the Holy One for a flame. And his point is that they are separate entities. In other words, there's Yahweh, And then there's the Holy One. Mm -hmm. So this, this title isn't just restricted to God. It goes beyond this. Um, and it's associated with part of the character of God's name. So just turn over to Isaiah 43. And we're just kind of following, I call this the fall of the white rabbit. We're following his argument along as this concept develops. Isaiah 43, and let's read verse 3. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia, and Seba in your place. Okay, so we're kind of pulling this out of its, out of its context to a degree. But again... Um, this is Yahweh, who is our God, or Israel's God, and he calls himself the Holy One of Israel, the Savior. So this Holy One of Israel is the Savior. Right? So he's associating this character of holiness with this idea of a Savior. And interestingly, in verse 11... Um, he says, I am God, or I am Yahweh, beside me there is no Savior. So again, it's, it's understanding, this is God manifestation, yeah. outside of God, there is no Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ could not have come and saved mankind by himself. <clears throat> the Father empowered him for the job that he had to do, and outside of God, there was no Savior. So, keeping that concept in mind, how that God differentiates himself here, um, and how that here he tells us that he's associating his characteristic of the Holy One of Israel with the Savior. Mm -hmm. Now let's just take a look at Psalm 16 and verses 9 to 10. So this is a messianic psalm, <coughs> a psalm about the Lord Jesus Christ, and you've heard this before, it'd be familiar to you. And uh, let's just read that together. Psalm 16, verses 9 to 10. Go ahead, Terry. Uh, it's Mary's turn. Oh, sorry. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. 
my flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my holy, whoops, my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So you see here how this is kind of extrapolated down. Here the Savior element, right, is the Holy One who's not going to be left in hell to see corruption. So this title of the Holy One now is applied to the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's why in the book of Revelation, he turns around and says, you know, he is the one who is termed the Holy One and the True One, because it is literally um, the Holy One. Um, and so here you have this, um, just for interest sake here, the Holy One in this case is slightly different than the other ones we've been looking at. Um, so this is the phrase we're looking at here. It's 2623, and it's Kassid, which means Godly One. Faithful one. And it's also uh, saint, kind one, etc. Is that um, sort of a derivative of your niece's? Like Kessid? Did, your, did yes. your niece's name come from there? Yeah. yeah. What else is it, Mom? What? Kessid. Think of it. Kessidic? Hasidic. The Jewish group, right? The Hasidic Jews, the Holy Ones, right? That's where this comes from. Oh, that's cool. Right? So this is the this the original sort of exp explanation of that. So when they like the ch, right, is the ha, right? So it's Hasidic, right? So the Hasid are the godly ones, or the faithful ones, or the holy ones. So they call themselves the holy ones, which is also the saints. So when we refer to ourselves as the saints, it's kind of like saying we're Hasidic. Just that's the Hebrew, we use the, uh, the Greek version of it. Um, but just I thought it was very interesting, um, and I'm just going to read you a little section from my brother Thomas. Except you don't have to be um, godly to be a saint. What's that? You don't have to be godly to be a saint. You don't have to be godly to, to be, be a saint. A saint which because is set apart? Is in the New you Testament, it's used in a, in a more general sense. It is. It's the ones that have been set apart. Yeah. You should yeah. be godly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you've been sanctified. But you can also yeah. treat the blood wherewith you've been sanctified as an unholy thing and do death right to the Spirit of Grace. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, hence, Corinthians is addressed to the saints, many of whom had serious problems. Oh, yeah. 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 It's messy work. Trying to perfect, <laughs> as trying Matt, to perfect saints. As Matt um, Norton spoke about the Levitical priesthood, remember Terry? You wrote yeah, they're blood soaked. They're yeah. blood soaked in the messy entrails and, and goodness knows what else. For the day and yeah. Then just, yeah. yeah, yeah. Work in the truth is messy work. So Brother Thomas comments on this. He says that the dead flesh or soul was not the holy one. Okay, so when you think of the body that was not going to see corruption. So the body in the grave was not the Holy One, contrary to all the churchy feeling and running around with the Holy Grail trying to collect the blood and all this nonsense, right? Or the, whatever they called it. Yeah, it was the Holy Grail. And then there was the Shroud of Turin and all the other nonsense, right? So like all that that ridiculousness. So he says that the dead flesh... It's time or, to find it when we're in Israel. What's that? The Grail. <laughs> Have fun with that. <laughs> this boy was, is was, getting a leash. I the wall. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I was really going up. <laughs> so, meanwhile, back at the ranch, the dead flesh or the soul was not the holy one. But when the mortal and corruptible flesh or soul was made alive by the Spirit of God, it became Yahweh Elohim, the Holy One of Israel, or Yahweh and His Holy One, the light, the fire, and the flame of Israel. So his point is, he was sanctified, really, at the point in time when he was perfected, right? Because he was no longer in the, the flesh state, which is corruptible, right? So... So this is the, the whole situation. And you could just tie into that. Um, we're not going to look it up, just for time's sake. But John chapter, for note's sake, John chapter 3 and verse 6, 
that which was born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So he was born of the spirit, hence he was um, spirit flesh at that point in time. Um, so he manifested his father, and um, I'm just going to give you these quotes because they're kind of along the same lines. And that's John chapter uh, 14, verse 6. We've already looked at these in previous classes, which of course says, No man comes to the Father but by me. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And then verses 9 to 10 um, continues on with that thought where he tells us that I am in the Father, the Father in me. The words I speak, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he does the works. So when you look at that, you see how that basically the reason he's the Holy One is because the Father dwells in him. And so when he calls us to be holy, as he is holy, the idea of being the chesed, right, or the hagios, the <coughs> saints, the only true way of doing that is to have the Word dwelling in us. That's what has to happen. The Word has to dwell in us as well. So, just to kind of close this loop, um, the idea basically of um, him being perfected. Let's just take a look at a couple of these. Luke chapter 13 and verse 32. Mom, if you are actually shaping, if you want to look that one up. Luke 13, 32. And then we're going to have um, Hebrews 2 and verse 9, Lisa. And then 5 and verse 10. So this is just how the Lord Jesus Christ was actually perfected, okay? So Luke 13, 32, and then Hebrews 2, verse 10, and 5, verse 9. And he said unto them, Go ye, and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils, and I do uh, cures to the day and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. So here's his point, the third day I'm going to be perfected. And these are actually typical days. So when you're looking at day for a year, right, this is another passage that you can use in that because he says today and tomorrow I do cures and whatever else. And the third day, which is the third year of his ministry, on that day he was going to be perfected. So this is one of those day for a year principles. So Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10. Nine. Nine. Uh, 10. I'm being oh. dyslexic. It's 2 verse 10 and 5 verse 9. For it became him who, for whom are all things, that by whom are all things, and bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect for suffering. Okay, so here the captain of salvation is made perfect. He doesn't start perfect. <coughs> being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Amen. So this is just kind of like following along with the Thomas's ideas that he was not perfect, he was not the Holy One in the fullest sense until he was made perfect. Um, and that's really um, the, the same route that we have to follow. So even though we are called to be saints, we are addressed as saints, just as they were addressed as saints, the Hasid of the, of the, um, of the Old Testament, so to speak. Um, it's a perfection process that has to have its um, outworking, I guess you could say, in the fact that we, we live a godly life, and by grace and mercy we are then uh, changed in our nature. And so... That's the, the process that is going on in our lives. So you're going to snap that one, Chafin. And then um, we're then going to move on to the next element, which is the key to the house of David. So this is the, the next expression. So he's described as being holy and true. Um, and, and elsewhere in Revelation, he's the faithful and the true witness as well. Um, that's Revelation 3.14. And so that was his, his position. But being the case, he has the key of David. So that's Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7. 
he's, he's given there the key of David. And that's what we're going to spend the rest of our time tonight looking at. What exactly does that mean? Because it's a pretty fundamental uh, concept. And um, there's a lot that, that rests upon it um, in the Gospels and in the, the whole idea of our first principles and whatever else. So the key of David is the phrase that we're picking up on. So this is Revelation 3 and verse 7. Again, we haven't passed that first verse yet. <laughs> so the key of David comes out, and the word key there is um, Strong's number 2807. K-L-I-C-E, and it basically does mean a key, but in the Strong's definition, um, the keeper of the key holds the power. I wonder what lo locks look like back then. Very different. When you say holds the power, holds the power that uh, the key unlocks? Or yeah, it's, yeah, he holds the power of what is locked. Okay. So whatever is locked, he, is the, he has the power over it. Okay. okay. So we'll come to that, Aaron, in just a minute, what the key actually looked like. There's a description in one of, the, uh, one of the old books that my dad gave me the other day, which was very helpful. Um, so we're going to look at three passages. Revelation 1.18, so this is how this is used then in the book of Revelation. Revelation 1.18, uh, 9 verses 1 to 2, and 20 verses 1 to 3. So these are all uses of the idea of the key, and the holding of the key being the holding of power, whatever is locked. So Revelation 1 and verse 18, whoever, I don't know where we got up here. Grandma? Did you read? Sure. Okay. <coughs> Revelation one eighteen. And then Ed, if you can do nine verses one to two. And Aaron twenty verses one to three. So we'll just go through them in succession. Okay. Revelation one eighteen. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. So the first one is the man of one who has the power, because he's got the keys of hell and death. So he's got the power over the grave and over death. So chapter 9, verses 1 to 2. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit. And there across a smoke of, out of the pit. And the smoke of a great furnace... And the sun in the air was dark, darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Okay, so this is the angel of the fifth trumpet, and he has the power over the bottomless pit, and he opens it, out comes smoke, and later on, of course, locusts and so on and so forth, which we'll get in later on. But the idea is he has the power to unleash whatever was locked in that abyss, right, in the pit of the abyss, or the bottomless pit. So Aaron 20, verses 1 to 3. <clears throat> then I saw an angel descending from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the abyss and a huge chain. He seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and tied him up for a thousand years. The angel then threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it, so that he could not deceive the nations until the one thousand years were finished. Mm. After these things, he must be released for a brief period of time. Okay, so this is the reverse. It's a different thing he's talking about, but you get the idea. In chapter 9, it's the power to unleash whatever was in that bottomless pit. In chapter 20, he takes the devil, or the dragon, and he locks him up in the bottomless pit and, and ties a great chain to him. So the idea, one is to shut up, and the other one is to, to release, right? So there's the two ideas that are expressed in this whole idea. Now, we want to go... Um, well, actually, I'm going to read you the little section from Clark's. No, actually, we'll, we'll go to Isaiah 20, or 22 first, because it'll make a little bit more sense. Isaiah 22, verses 21 to 22. 
So this is this is the description of sort of like what does it mean? How is this idea used? Isaiah 22 verses 21 to 22 now is getting more into what does it mean in the sense of the key of David. So we've established the idea that a key is the idea of having authority over something. And you can think of that in the sense of, you know, they give somebody the keys to a city. It's a symbolic act, but you're given the keys to the city. I mean, literally, we don't lock cities up anymore, but they used to. You know, you got the key. That you can get to the city. Get her back into his house. Get into his house. <laughs> don't they? When don't you were 21. Terribly out of wood. Yeah. They still symbolically do that in Belfast, don't they? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, you can get the key. Like, you'll symbolically get keys to the city all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. All four of us got keys to Dad's house. <laughs> wood one. Well, this lost. Isaiah 22 then, uh, verses 21 to 22. So this is now, we're, we're going from what a key is yep. to the specifics of the key of David. Yep. I will clothe him with your robe and fasten your sash around him and hand your authority over to him. He will be a father to those who live in Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David what he opens, no one can shut, and what he shut, no one can open. Now, we're going to come back and look at the context in a minute. So, the key to the house of David is on the shoulder. And you think, well, that's awfully interesting. Why would the key be on the shoulder? Maybe it's a very big key. It is a very big key. Yeah. Okay, so let me just read you this little section from Clark's. So this is going back into Greek um, mythology and into Greek history. The priestess of Juno is said to be the key bearer for the goddess. A female high in office under great, the great queen had the same title. Calipho was the key bearer of the Olympian queen. The mark of office was likewise among the Greeks as here in Isaiah born on the shoulder. The priestess of Ceres, which Brother Thomas quotes, had the key on her shoulder. To comprehend how the key could have been born on the shoulder, it's necessary to say something of the form of it. One sort of keys, and that probably um, the ancient, was of considerable magnitude, and as to the shape, very much bent and crooked. Uh, Arasus Aratus, um, to give his reader an idea of the form of the constellation Cassiopeia, compares it to a key. And of course, Cassiopeia is the sickle, right? So Homer describes the key of Ulysses' storehouse as a large curvature, um, and he explains that, saying that it was like the shape to a reap hook. Um, the curved part was introduced into the keyhole, and being properly directed into the handle, took hold of the bolts within and moved them from their place. And of course the bolts were all wood at this point in time. We may easily collect from this account that such a key would have been very well upon the shoulder, for it must have been considerable size and weight, and could hardly have been carried commodiously otherwise. So the idea is it's almost like a sickle shape. And so the key would be something that you would insert into the door, which is, we're talking the door of a city, right? So it's a, a massive door, and it would be pushed in, and by turning it, it would be turning the mechanism, which is a whole bunch of cogs and whatever else, that would release then the lock of the gate, and the door would open. So they're basically, these old historians are saying, like, it's basically like a scythe almost, or a, a large crescent. And of course, that way it could be worn on the shoulders as well, because it's not a—it's not a—it's not going to cut your head off side. It's just its shape, right? It's the shape of a side, so it's in a circular shape, and it would be laid upon the shoulders, right? So the idea of the government being upon the shoulder is the key being upon the shoulder. So let's just. Is that why today you have all these mayors that have these chains Correct. on their neck? And the mitres in the parliament and in England and in Ottawa? Yes. yes. The, the power and authority? Yes. All the same sort of same concept. Yeah. 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 Mitres. Mitres. The, the mace that he wears Thank you. in parliament in Ottawa. Okay. But I don't know what, what that means. Yeah. I thought I was guessing too. No, that's, that's another, another word. Okay. Another, another so, 
Let's just go to Isaiah 9, okay. verses 6 to 7, which is a messianic prophecy. He probably doesn't even know the history. So Josiah, Isaiah 9, um, verses 6 to 7. And this is, of course, a prophecy about Emmanuel, right? Whose name means God with us. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the, of the increase of his government, of and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it, and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. <coughs> the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. Perfect. Thank you very much, Sai. So here you have then the expression about Emmanuel that the government is going to be upon his shoulder. Now we've sort of you know, when I first read that years ago, I thought, you know, the authority or the, the crushing weight of the government, you know, like the crown is heavy, sort of, we use that statement. Mm. It's not really what it's referring to. It's talking really about the idea of the, the power or the authority, the key, will rest upon his shoulder. It's really connecting with Isaiah 22, verses 21 and 22. So this idea then is that the government's going to be on his fo- shoulder, and it's upon the throne of David and his kingdom that this is going to take place. So it connects to the key of the house of David, and of course the kingdom. So we have Revelation 3, verse 7, it's the key of David. It's the whole idea of having the authority over the house of David and over the kingdom of David. Now, interestingly, if you just take a look at... Um, Acts 15, 16. Charlene, if you could read that for us. And then Samuel is going to read where it's quoting from, which is Amos chapter 9 and verse 11. After this, I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen, and close up the breaches thereof. And I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. Okay, so here you have two passages. And just notice where we started. He's going to return. Right? Remember we were talking about the remnant that would return? and that would raise up, right? So here we have returning, building the habitation or the dwelling place of David, which is the house of David. Well, it's the key of David over here, and he's going to raise the tabernacle of David, which is that same word, um, K-U-W-M, that we were looking at, kum, which means to stand up or to raise up. He's going to raise up his ruins. He's going to raise up the tabernacle of David. That's going to be what this individual is going to do. So it's quite fascinating that this, of course, is the destiny of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he is the one that is going to be um, about this very task. Now, um, just one second. I got a note here that this has something to do with the title of the first Christian Albert name. Interesting. What's that, Fred? Tabernacle? The first Christian Albert name. What word is it called? Yeah. Come on, we didn't make enough notes. 
I think I just deleted a whole page of my notes when I was typing this early in the morning. Go to your trash bin. No, it would have been while I was typing it. That's what happens when you get up too early. Well, that's what happens when you're trying to catch up. Okay, so we're going to revert to the original. You can't miss this piece. I even did a printout for it. So we want to go back to Isaiah 22, um, which is where we sort of began this whole thing. Actually, Shape, if you want to take a shot of that. The best laid plans of mice and men. My goal was to actually to um, Bible mark this in before I got to this, but I never did get there. So you have to just bear with me for one moment. Let's see if I missed it. No, oh, there it is. <coughs> Didn't delete it. We're okay. Okay, so the day is saved. I just turned too many pages. So this is the concept that's going on here of the house of David, the government being on his shoulder, it being built when he returns, of course, and he's going to raise up the tabernacle of David. He's going to resurrect it. And it's all built on the parable that is contained in Isaiah chapter 22. So let's actually read a section of it. We're going to start, and we're going to read Isaiah 22, verses 15 down to 19. Now, this is about a man named Shevna, who was the scribe. Isaiah 22, verses 15 down to 16. Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, Go, get thee unto this treasure, even unto Shevna, which is over the house and the cellar. What hast thou here? And whom hast thou here? That thou hast heard thee out of the sepulchre. Here as the as he that heweth him out a sepulchre on high, and that giveth the habitation for himself in a rock. Um, go to nineteen. Yep, keep on going. Okay. Yeah. Behold, Yahweh will carry thee away with a mighty captivity, and will surely cover thee. He will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country. And there thou shalt die, and there the chariots of thy glory shall be the shame of thy Lord's house. Okay, so here you have Shebna who is the treasurer. And um, what we have here is this, this man, Shebna, has built himself a tomb, right? Because he's Jewish, right? And they, they like their tombs. He's built himself a tomb. He's carved it out of the rock. And he's prepared it for the place of his burial eventually when he dies. Remember, Joseph of Arimathea had built himself yes. a tomb, right? So, and he carved it out of the rock, right? Well, here God's telling Shebna, buddy, you're not going to be buried here. You're going to be taken captive, and you're going to be taken somewhere else. Well, now, Shebna's name is an interesting name, and this is really the parable in this whole thing. So we have Shebna, and it's the Hebrew uh, 7644 is the Strong's number, and it is from... And that, that number there is the idea of growing, um, but another Bible dictionary relates it to the word Shevna, or Shava, which is what Brother Thomas also relates it to, 7617, which means to lead captive. And where the two are tied together, Shevna means to grow up, or to, to ascend kind of thing, to go up. And leading captive is the idea of taking somebody 
captive, mm -hmm. like to, to pluck them out of the hands. There's kind of a com combination there. So the whole idea of this is that Israel is going to be taken captive. Right. So this is what it stands for. Israel taken captive. Now remember what we were looking at where it talked about the remnant being taken captive. Okay. So interestingly enough, archaeological discoveries being what they are, they have discovered this um, tomb, and this is the writing upon the tomb. And it's basically the tomb of Shebaniah, which they believe is the Shebna, who was treasurer in the time of Hezekiah, and it's dated to them. And there's a little warning on here saying, like, do not open this tomb, there's nothing in it, just the bones of Shebna and his mate, basically. Although Shebna was probably never buried there, because, no. as the prophecy says, he's actually going to be taken captive. Um, but that was actually taken in Jerusalem, um, or found by Jerusalem, and was chipped off by the Brits and taken and now sits in the British Museum. Um, but that's the very man in this prophecy, because it's dated to the time of Hezekiah. It's related to the fact that he was the treasurer, which is what Shebna was, the scribe and the treasurer. And, um, but it's interesting, notice what is said here, that he is going to lose his position. And he says, he will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country. And uh, the idea there is of like a ball of yarn, so it's something that's been wrapped up, so it's circular, that's why it's a ball, that the Hebrew actually means to be circular. And the idea is basically woven up like a ball, and he's going to be tossed into um, this, this, uh, this barn, or into this, this, this field. So, just fascinatingly, that, that this is, I was like, oh great, we got to see this when we go to Israel, and then I realized it's not in Israel, it's in the British Museum, so. I'll do <laughs> um, but, uh, but none that, yeah, robbed by the Brits. Where in uh, Israel is the tomb? Tombs in Jerusalem. So, I'm going to see if we can locate it, um, if we're right in that area. I'm not sure if we can or not. Um, but, very interesting, though, that this, I mean, Brother Thomas didn't know anything about this, because it wasn't discovered at the time, you know, but now it's, uh, it's been taken, and it's, it's Biblical Archaeology Review, and there's lots of other ones, but Elaine has it, um, there's a book on archaeology I was just reading that has the same picture in it, and it's just fascinating that this is the very man, um, and this is the very tomb, that God says, well, look, you've gone and dug yourself a tomb, you're not even going to be buried here, you're going to be taken captive, and of course that's the story He's a of what took place. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, just a fascinating uh, little piece of, of history in the whole thing um, is the royal household, which meant nothing. Which meant nothing because that was all going to get transferred to somebody else. So, <coughs> verses twenty to twenty-five, if we could, Isaiah twenty-two, verses twenty to twenty-five. Then I will come about in that day, it will come about, that I will summon my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your tunic, and tie your sash securely about him. And I will entrust him with your authority, and he will become father of, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Then I will set the key of the house of David on his shoulder. When he opens, no one will shut. When he shuts, no one will open. And I will drive him like a peg in a firm place, and I will become a throne of glory to his father's house. Is that it? Yep, that's good enough for now. Well, that's quite a section. Okay, so here you have Eliakim. When we look at what he's going to do in a minute, his word, his name is Eliakim, right? El, which is God, and Kum, which is to raise. Now remember Amos? I'm going to raise the tabernacle of David. It's the same word kum there. 
as is used here, where Eliakim means God will raise up, right? So, God will raise up or cause to stand. And, as a cross-reference to that, as Lori has said, Anastasis, Isaiah 26, verse 19, we won't look it up, but it says, Thy dead shall live, my dead body shall they arise, which is the same word, kum, which means to raise up. So it's the idea of the resurrection of the dead, right? So he is going to resurrect, he's going to cause him to stand up, and it typifies the restorative work of the Lord Jesus Christ because he's going to be involved in raising up. Not only is this man going to be raised up, which is interesting, that it's a garden tomb where it is carved out of stone, which is where the Lord Jesus Christ was put and was caused to be raised up. Um, but he says in, in chapter 49 of Isaiah... In verse 6, if somebody can just look that one up, Isaiah 49, verse 6. And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserve of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Okay, so we've looked at this one. To raise up, right, the tribes of Jacob. He's going to restore them. He's going to raise them up. So you've got the one man who's Shebna the scribe, who's all about, basically, or the treasurer. It's, it's the idea of being led captive. And his power and his authority is transferred to Eliakim, God will cause to stand, and this man is going to raise up, or cause to stand, kum, the same word, the tribes of Jacob, right? So, Acts chapter 1, verse 6, you don't have to look it up, um, but it states, it's a question that the disciples asked the Lord Jesus Christ, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Right? So it's the whole idea of the restoration or the restoring again of the kingdom to Israel. So just take a look then at verses 20 and 21 of Acts chapter two, uh, 22 and see what happens there. We've already read it. He says, look, I will clothe him, which is Eliakim, in thy robe, Shebna. Right? And strengthen him with thy girdle. And I'm going to commit the government to his hand. He's going to be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And the house of Judah. And the key of David is going to be on his shoulders. So the treasurer was one who had the control over the wealth. Which of course relates to power and authority. And he's told that all of that's going to be transferred to I like him. Now, do we have an Old Testament parallel to this? Well, sure we do. Can you think of it? His robe, I'm going to give, your robe, I'm going to give to him. Oh, um, Elijah and Elisha. Elijah and Elisha, yep. the transferring of the mantle, and there's yep. another one. Jonathan. Jonathan and David. Remember what Jonathan did? Yep. Yep. He took off his robe, he gave it to David. You're going to be the king. Yep. It was the passing on of the authority, right? So both Elijah and, of course, you've got Jonathan and David, the passing on the authority. Well, that's what's going on here. So Shebna, which is kind of the symbol of, of Israel that's taken into captivity, they are going to be resurrected under Eliakim, the one who God will cause to stand. He's going to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and he will get the authority and the power, which moves away now from the Mosaic law, down to the one who God is going to cause to stand for himself. It so just occurs to me too, Jonathan, that Shevna being the treasurer, I mean, mm -hmm. typically people with money get real comfortable. Yes. Right? And so the money 
is the world's comfort level. So and comfortable just, that he built his own grave that he was never going to use. Yeah, and so it just gets <laughs> taken from him. So it's yeah, all yeah, about stewardship, good. proper yeah. stewardship, right? Yeah. Well, it's interesting, too. He was a wealthy man. Yeah. So was Joseph of Arimathea. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right? Because your right. average Joe couldn't afford to have a tomb built out of the rocks. Of the They'd have a hole yeah. in the ground, and that's where you chuck them, right? You know, like this was... This was more the wealthy family. So you think of like the wealthy families, like Caiaphas, yeah. and they found the tomb of Caiaphas and the ossuary of Caiaphas, and yeah. how the Caiaphas' bones were all collected, and they would, generation after generation, they would keep these tombs, and they would wipe them, and all this kind of stuff. And the Lord goes, what a ridiculous practice. They're full of dead men's bones, right? Yeah. Yeah. Traditionally speaking, it was the wealthy that purchased the tombs like this. Abraham was a wealthy man. He purchased the cave of Machpelah, right? Because people want to be honored in death and in life. Yeah. It's about right. your plaque on the wall. Well, it's like preservation, right? Yes. It's the preservation, um, in, a, in a lot of ways, um, of... of uh, lineage. Lineage, I guess. The body. I mean, to a point, like, Jacob wanted his bones taken back to... Um, Israel and buried in that cave. Right. Joseph says, "Do not leave my bones in Egypt." Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's so it's a question of faith. I was reading about that today. There's eight people that were buried in that grave that Abraham bought. Yeah. Okay. Eight people. Yeah. Leah, oh, right down. And with Joseph, were probably probably it would appear buried all of the um, yeah. the patriarchs, uh, the t the twelve brothers, um, not just Joseph. The Spirit of the two men, Shebna versus Joseph of Arimathea, he was willing to give up. Correct. His. Yeah. Yeah. Tomb. It's interesting what was entrusted to the wealthy, the security of the generation. You know? Well, I always wonder whether Elikan was actually buried in this tomb. It's quite possible. Because Shebna's taken captive. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tomb that's never been used, yeah. it's been hewn out. <clears throat> You know, you wonder whether that's where Elijah ended up, you know. But, yeah, I, who knows, Joseph right? Joseph Iron Myth is, the tomb wasn't probably used by him at all. It was used by Christ. Yeah. Maybe once. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> that we yeah. really don't know. I mean, no, at least we know it's yeah. vacant uh, three days later. <laughs> 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 you don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Very good point. And probably never used again. <laughs> well, that would... You, I highly work. doubt, though, that they would have kept it for a shrine. I'm sure it would have been recycled. Right. Yeah. Contrary to, you know, what they tell us, yeah. the tour guides. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tour guides. Well, they do that all the time. Back. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just go to um, Luke twenty-one or Luke chapter one, because this is this idea of the Eliakim, the one who God will cause to stand up, which is basically the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, so Luke one, this is his destiny. Um, and verse 30 to 31, this is the angel Gabriel, we've read this many times, but just let's go read it through again now, put it in context of this. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Oh, don't start reading it. 32. 32, thank you. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Yeah, so that yeah. is his destiny. Yeah. Yeah. The government will be upon his shoulder. It will be his shoulder. But he's also the one that God's going to cause to stand. So if you come to Daniel chapter 12, and we've looked at this before as well, but now kind of plugging it back into this prophetic title and into this letter of the Ecclesias, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. Yeah. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even that or to do, sorry even to that same time and at that time thy people shall be delivered every one that 
shall be found written in a book. What is it, teacher? Uh, verse 3. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So here again you have at that time, and the first question you're going to ask is, what time? Right? Well, the time is the time of verse 40. At the time of the end when the king of the south pushes at the king of the or at him, and then the king of the north comes against him, right? And you have the invasion going on. At the same time that all that's going to take place, which is basically Armageddon and its prelude, Michael, who is like El, is going to stand up, right? The whole anastasis process. And this is, of course, the Isaiah passage we looked at, 26 verse uh, 19, Thy dead shall live, my dead body shall they arise. They all stand up in him, because, of course, he's Eliakim, um, which is basically the one who God causes to stand up. And this is the resurrection of the, the man of one, because he's going to come and he's going to sit on David's throne that we just looked at. And it's here that we're told that many that sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So the saints now are raised up with him into life. I mean, there is the judgment process, obviously, that's there. But those that are wise, that turn many to, to righteousness, are going to become like the stars forever, like the constellations, so to speak. And they are going to be part of that man of one, who is depicted in the book of Revelation chapter 1, who has the keys of hell and death. So he has the key in his hand. And it's this man of one that is talking to us in Revelation chapter 3, mm -hmm. saying that I am the holy one and the true one, and I have the key of David. Right. So this is a composite picture, and it involves us, because Revelation 2 verse 20 says... To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I've overcome and am sat with my father in his throne. So we have then the same key invested upon us because we become co-regents with him. Obviously not at the same level by any stretch of the imagination, but we're invited to join him. It's what the apostles were told, Matthew 19.23. They ask him, Lord, you know, we've forsaken all, followed you. What, what's in it for us? What will we get? To you which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits upon the throne of his glory, you also will sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So we are totally involved in this whole picture, and that's what we get in Revelation chapter 3. This is the man of one who has, or is the holy one and the true one, and he has the key of David, and that key, of course, is on his shoulder. He is Emmanuel, God with us, which is what we have to become. We have to become manifestations of the character of Almighty God, developing that in us.